1887, Buffalo Bill Cody in his Wild West show. Buffalo Bill's ringing introduction to his Congress of the Rough Riders of the World was captured in one of the earliest sound and picture recordings. This was the voice of America. Ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce to you a Congress of the Rough Riders of the World. In the age of cowboys and Indians, the westward movement of America's pioneers fired the English language with a new inventiveness and energy. As the 19th century unfolded, American English was to catch the ear of the world, from Europe to the Far East. by a grant from General Foods Corporation. General Foods, where ideas are growing to satisfy a demanding world. And the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Yorktown, 1781. The final battle in the War of Independence. The tremors of this political earthquake went to the roots of the language as well. We're told that the triumphant revolutionaries piped Yankee Doodle Dandy to the surrender ceremony. The British played a melancholy air. The world turned upside down. If buttercups buzzed after the bee, if boats were on land, churches on sea, if ponies rode men, and if grass ate the cows, then cats should be chased into holes by the mouse. This was the point at which Britons and Americans, as they later said, began to be divided by their common language. If summer was spring and the other way round, then all the world would be upside down. It was in Philadelphia, the center of the revolution, that the founding fathers made the break with the old country. Many of the men who gathered here to make this momentous decision had an elegant command of English and were fascinated by its uses. And it fell to Thomas Jefferson to write one of the most thrilling and influential passages in all of English prose, the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The political revolutionaries were also language revolutionaries. Tom Paine, the pamphleteer, actually coined the phrase, the United States of America. John Adams, the future president, proposed an academy to regulate the development of an American language. One of the signers of the declaration was the printer, Benjamin Franklin. His printing press is still at work in Philadelphia. Patriots like Franklin championed brand new words, what they called Americanisms. Presidential, bamboozle, calculate, seaboard, colonization, belittle, advocate, and even bookstore. The first Americans also began to rationalize English spellings, writing honor, O-R and theater, ER. 
Noah Webster was America's pioneering lexicographer. His famous dictionaries popularized these new spelling conventions. A lifelong student of American English is Alistair Cook. Uh, Webster's dictionary was, I think, uh, a deliberate attempt to uh, give for the first time a dictionary which would be a help to all the incoming populations, especially foreigners, of immigrants. And, of course, he gave pronunciations. And whether he knew it or not, it was obviously going to be extremely difficult to reproduce the idiomatic pronunciations that Americans used and that the English used. Uh, you can't put down waistcoat and then tell people it's pronounced waistcoat and forehead, and they should say forehead. And the dictionary was an attempt to straighten out idiomatic English pronunciation. What he did was to give equal quantity to each syllable. Hence, Americans learned, especially immigrants, to say thorough and forehead and waistcoat, and it's, I think, the reason why that has persisted through generations. Come unto me, ye heroes, and I the truth will tell. Concerning many a soldier for his country fell. The English king's commander, cursed Tory crew. With Indians and Canadians, the up Lake Champlain flew. The up Lake Champlain flew. Another result of the Revolutionary War was the making of a distinctive Canadian English. When the British Redcoats lost the war, the enemies of the Revolution were in an impossible position. Attacked by mobs, many of the hated Tory loyalists escaped to Canada. Later, the War of 1812 cemented the separate identity of English Canada. Americans and Canadians haven't fought each other since the War of 1812. They boast the longest undefended frontier in the world. And yet, Canadian identity has always meant a certain resistance to American ways, including speech. Only a cannon shot separates Fort George, Ontario, from Fort Erie, New York, over there. The people come and go across the border all the time. The air is filled with their common broadcasting, and yet they speak differently. Over here, in Canada, for example, that is a house. Over there, in the United States, it's a house. The up Lake Champlain food, the up Lake Champlain food, with Indians and Canadians, the up Lake Champlain food. Many loyalists fled to Canada in the direction of Niagara Falls. The loyalist speech of the Niagara Peninsula shaped a new variety of English, according to Professor Jack Chambers. The Loyalists arrived in southern Ontario from various Midland states, but, but particularly from Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and inland Vermont. And their speech formed the basis of standard Canadian speech. The accent that I'm using right now has its basis in, in that Loyalist movement from into, into southern Ontario. To avoid Niagara Falls, the Loyalists built a canal linking the St. Lawrence River with the Great Lakes. Today, it is part of the St. Lawrence Seaway, cutting straight through southern Ontario. It's here among the workers on this great trading route that you can hear the measured voice of Canadian English. The most characteristic sounds of the Canadian English accent are heard in words like house, out, about, uh, and, and so on. South is a, is a good one. People from other dialect areas notice that and can pick up on that and, and, and identify 